Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and we are here for day number three in the quarterfinal stage of Worlds. And we really are starting to get a pretty clear picture on what the rest of this tournament is going to look like. Obviously, we have started the bracket stage. We know the teams that are, you know, in the top eight going to be playing some major series. We know two of the teams already that are heading to the semifinals Weibo Gaming and Billy Billy Gaming on the top side, two LPL teams. There's a chance we could be seeing a third move on to. Today, or we could be seeing our first LPL team get knocked out of the bracket stage if there is a potential upset. A very exciting matchup here today, but I'd love to know you guys' thoughts and opinions on everything down in the comment section below. What did you think of this series, not only with your expectations going into it, but did it live up to your expectations? Were you more impressed or less impressed with the gameplay? Was it fun for you to watch? I'm always interested in knowing you guys' thoughts on everything down below. Do you agree with me? Do you not? It's always interesting to hear you know what you guys have to say in a lot of these games, but you know, before we jump into things, very quickly, if you find yourself enjoying the video at any point, it really would mean a lot if you hit that like button. It doesn't have to be now before you've seen any of the content, but in 5, 10, you know, 25 minutes, if you're enjoying the video, it really would mean a lot to me if you hit that like button and if you hit subscribe so you can be around for the rest of the videos. But I don't want to pander to you guys too much. At the beginning, it's time to jump into the video proper. If you are new here, what we do on this channel is we're going to go game by game talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I'll be giving a player of the game and a of the game for each individual game and at the end of the series I'll be giving a player of the series to kind of tie everything into a nice neat little bow we'll quickly talk about how the bracket is shaping out of course we're not quite going to know the matchup for the semifinals after today's game because we still have tomorrow's series to go over and the the winner of that will play the winner of today but still it's definitely going to be intriguing to know our third team to enter the top four here in the world but who are the two teams that are playing today? Well, it's a really fun matchup between the number one seed from the LPL in JD Gaming and the number three seed from the LCK in KT Rolster. Really like this matchup for both sides. I feel so bad for KT Rolster. It's an absolutely miserable draw, which just kind of compounds on the fact that they've had miserable draws at Worlds so far already. Uh, basically irrelevant of everything else. They've just not been able to catch a break. They've only had to play top eight-ish teams at this tournament to even qualify for the bracket stage and the Swiss stage in the first place and that's never ideal and then they finally get here to the quarterfinals and who do they draw but the best team in the world right now in JD Gaming it's certainly not favorable towards them but I think KT Rolster is a better team than people give them credit for We've been seeing a lot of people doubt KT Rolster. You know, saw a lot of top analysts, a lot of top content creators not putting them in their pickums and their top eight pickums going into the tournament. And I thought that was ridiculous. I felt very confident about KT Rolster going into this. Not only did they perform incredibly well in the regular season in the summer split, but they were okay in the playoffs as well. They just couldn't get past T1, who is a good team. We've seen it over the course of this tournament. It's not like T1 is some pushover team. They're still in here. They have a chance to be moving on to the semifinals as well in tomorrow's series. And so, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world to lose two series to them and they very easily were able to qualify us at number three seed in the regional qualifiers this is a genuinely good KT team now some of these players have played both better and worse than they did domestically I think a lot of the power balance has shifted on how this team has wanted to win games internationally as opposed to what they were doing in the LCK most specifically this bot lane has just been better I, I was really high on Lehens in the regular season you know he won MVP in the LCK not for me but for the broadcast and he was second in my voting it's not like I didn't think he deserved it, and he was my number one support heading into this tournament. He has done nothing but reiterate that over the course of this tournament. He's genuinely been phenomenal as a setup player. He's been really good on enchanters in particular, which I think was always going to be a question mark with him and his play style, but aiming has really been the star for this team at this tournament so far, and it's really good to see aiming step up as an ADC. There's been so many good bot laners that have just really kind of taken over at this tournament. It's a meta where you can really take advantage of a lot of those positives that you can create as a bot lane player. And I think Aiming's been doing that at a high level, like at a genuinely elite level. I put him above Gumayushi in my rankings, you know, going into the quarterfinals for a reason. Not because I dislike Guma, but because I really do think that's where Aiming has been performing. So, bot lane has stepped up. Top side's been a little bit more questionable. Keen was by far the best top laner in the LCK in 2023. There really isn't a lot of debate in that argument. I think Doran is really the only player that could even remotely touch him in terms of domestic performance. But Keen was kind of just the best by a large margin. And it's just not translated to the international national stage, even against other LCK top laners that he was beating in the regular season. I don't think the argument that, oh, LCK top laners are bad, therefore Keen beating them didn't actually show that Keen was good 
applies to what we've seen at this tournament because he's been losing to players like Kana and, you know, players that he's played against over the course of the regular season a lot harder than he did when he was in the LCK. I just don't think he's having a particularly good tournament at the moment, which is certainly concerning because topside was a big win condition for this team, but they can play through mid and obviously they've been able to play through bot at this tournament and that's definitely a way to win. Unfortunately for them, they're going into JD Gaming, who is just the, the best team in the world until proven otherwise at the moment. Two-time LPL champions, the MSI champions, you know, there's really not a lot this team hasn't been able to do. They have the opportunity to complete the Golden Road for the first time in history if they win Worlds here, and it's certainly on the table. This is the strongest roster ever conceived, ever created at a pro level. It's basically all-stars in every single role, and that's what makes it so difficult when you're talking about a player like Keen starting to underperform. Well, he's got to go into 369, who's just simply one of the best top laners in the world, certainly one of the most consistent on the weak side, but he can carry games. He was a carry top laner before he joined super teams. That was kind of the MO on 369. You have the best jungle, you have the best mid, you have the best bot laner, and you have one of, if not the best support in the game and missing. It's, it's really just an unfair lineup to have to go into. I think matchup-wise, KT is obviously going to be underdogs for a reason, but they can win this series if they do buckle down and put themselves in a good position. But are they going to be able to do that? I think obviously taking game number one is certainly going to help with that, but who's going to win game one? Well, going game by game means we get to start with it, and the winner of game number one was... KT Rolster, they are going to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up once and nothing, and that's massive. That is absolutely huge. I talk all the time on this channel about how important generating momentum and confidence at the beginning of a big series like this is, and that's exactly what KT did. This team was really, really good in a lot of their domestic performances when they were able to get confident, when they were able to play through their jungle and their bot lane, and when those players were really stepping up and performing at a high level, but in this game, it was everybody. I think you could really make a case that everybody was on a good path. I don't think Topside really did all that much, but he didn't really need to. Everybody else in this team played incredibly well. Their individual, like, micro in some of these team fights was better than I've seen from basically any other team at this tournament in any game. This is genuinely, in my opinion, maybe the most impressive game a team has played at Worlds in 2023 so far, and that's crazy to say because they just did this against JD Gaming, and credit to JDG, they tried their best to make a comeback towards the back half of this game, tried to, you know, take some fights around major objectives, but KT Rolster was simply better. They were able to generate a lead in the early game, and they never let it go. They played basically perfectly throughout the end. I think a worse team would have lost this game to JD Gaming, and I know that sounds weird because of just how much of a disparity there is in, like, the gold and the kill difference and things like that, but... This game was not a complete blowout. JDG actually had moments where they were looking pretty interesting, and KT Rolster shut the door on them. As per usual, let's go ahead and start off with draft talk, though. That's how we like to kick off this segment, is talking a little bit about the draft, and I think this is a big reason why KT Rolster was able to win this game. This is a major draft gap, in my opinion, coming in from KT. I think you essentially have three winning lanes, as well as a winning jungle matchup in this one, which is never great. I think I'm so happy to see R5 Akali come out from KT Rolster. We've seen so many teams at this tournament self counterpick themselves in the mid lane whether that's Azir into Orianna or Orianna into like Akali or Syndra or you know something like that or like even a Akali into Azir right there's so many times where teams have just self counterpicked themselves put themselves in a bad position in the mid lane and that's not what happened here B1 Orianna by night gets super punished by R5 Akali and Akali goes on and just dominates that laning phase moves around the map and has a fantastic game I know I'm maybe a broken record at this point, but Orianna is certainly not this champion that just insta-wins the game. Like, I know everybody wants to blind her on B1 because she's super consistent in the back half, but her laning phase is very exploitable, and we saw that again here. The Akali just had way more pressure, not only in the 1v1, where she did dominate, but she was moving around the map, she was making Sejuani's life a lot easier, the objective game was super easy, and, and whatever, essentially, you know, objective or area of the map they wanted to control, they could in the early game because of the pressure they were able to generate in the mid lane. It was just a massive advantage to have that matchup in the mid lane, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but this is something we've seen time and time and time again at this tournament, is if you get a good matchup in the mid lane, which there really isn't, like, a... It's not hard to do, especially on red side. Like, that's the way for red side to win the game. I know a lot of people see blue side as broken, but... 
Red side can win if they get good matchups in the mid lane. It really is that much of a power point. And Akali was certainly strong in this game. I think the rest of this map also wins. Aphelios is just generally good into a champion like Zeri, although they opted into the Zeri into Aphelios matchup because I think they like the scaling. But Aphelios just offers way more in the early game, specifically because you have that Lulu next to that Rakan. Rakan's good, but uh, Aphelios Lulu is just going to be stronger in the early game and you're going to have more pressure in some of those skirmishes. You have to wait a little bit longer for Zeri to get online, which is not ideal because, again, Akali's going to have a ton of pressure in the mid lane to be able to move around the map and potentially threaten that Zeri, and then you've got Sejuani uh, being able to play alongside, like, the Jax on the top side, which is probably Renekton's worst matchup at this tournament. It's just not very good stuff from JD Gaming. I'm honestly really disappointed in their draft. They went for a lot of quote-unquote power picks, and then they got counterpicked in a lot of roles, and they ended up losing. This is why I wasn't freaking out yesterday when... You know, uh, there were teams giving over, like, Rumble plus Jarvan plus Oriana plus Zaya. I'm okay, in theory, with giving over most of those picks. Probably not Zaya and ideally not Jarvan, but... Yeah, give over Rumble, give over Oriana. These champions are beatable. They're not, like, completely undestroyable in the meta right now. I know everybody wants to prioritize them, but this is what happens when you put yourself in a good position with better draft picks, and I'm really proud of KT for it, and I'm really glad to see that a lot of the advice I've been preaching over the course of this tournament has kind of proven right, but that was a long draft segment. Anyways, BDD was awesome. You can talk about the Akali and Ori matchup being super Akali favored and making it a lot easier, but BDD still had to perform super well in a lot of these team fights, and he absolutely did. He's going to get player of the game for game number one, it's really nice to see him outperform Knight. Again, I know it's an easier matchup, but you've got to be able to see it on tape. If you're given a good matchup, you have to be able to win it. That's the question, and that's always kind of been the concern with a lot of mid laners over the course of this tournament. Even with, like, Chobi versus Yagao yesterday. Yagao was given winning matchup after winning matchup after winning matchup every single game, and still he wasn't dominating in lane. You need to be able to take advantage of those draft gaps if you are that team, and I think BDD did that better than anybody else here, although I want to give a lot of credit to Cuz. I think he was spectacular on the Sejuani. He's been so good across this year. My opinion of him has basically completely changed. He's gone back to being a borderline, like, elite top three in the world level jungler for me. He's just really good. Lehens was really good on Lulu. This is a pick that's super popular in the LCK. Not as popular elsewhere, but Korean supports love them some Lulu still. They're not out on it, and I agree. And obviously, I'm a big fan of Aphelios, and Aiming has had a really good tournament. He made basically no mistakes. His positioning in the back half of this game was sensational as well. Keen really didn't do anything on the top side. I'm not going to sit here and be like, Keen was a big difference maker, but the bot side of this map one so hard that it didn't really matter what happened on the top side. And then for JDG on the other side of this map, I don't know, man. Uh, this is this is a weird draft. Like, I, I just, I wouldn't go for this. I think it's a little bit ego, if I'm being entirely honest. I do think Oriana B1 is ego, and I get it. A bunch of other teams are taking it. I do like Rakan on B3. I think that's the other pick that I feel good about. Even the Rel on B5, I think, is definitely playable, but Renekton, Zeri, I just don't feel great about these picks in terms of what they actually offer. Renekton opens the door for things to get worse, and you picked it into Jax, which I just think is a super hard matchup for Renekton right now. Probably his hardest in terms of the meta champions at the tournament, and you yourself opted into that matchup. Same thing with Zeri into Aphelios. I get the idea of potentially wanting to scale up, but you just don't really have the option when Aphelios has so much pressure in the early game compared to you, and the team just really takes advantage of that. You're taking the control and the ability to outplay your opponent out of your hands and putting it into your opponent's hands to be able to do. I do think they could have played better. Knight basically never hit a shockwave this entire game. This was a bad game from him. He's going to get done of the game. He has these every once in a while where he can just be a little bit irrelevant. Usually they're isolated. Is He had these in the LPL playoffs as well, where he'll have like one game every couple series where it's like, oh, what was happening there? And then the next three games, he'll just completely pop off and dominate like that's kind of what I'm expecting because that's more of what Knight has been doing all year long but he's not immune to bad games no player in the world is immune to bad games that's why I'm always defending a lot of these top tier players when it's like oh you know x player had a really bad series yeah he's allowed to have a bad series everybody has bad series nobody bats a thousand even the best players in the world but like ruler was kind of suspect in this game his positioning wasn't ideal Kanavi's engages weren't working 369 like I said opted into a bad matchup he was all right on the top side and missing was just a couple of you know centimeters away from turning some of these fights on Rakan, but that's all that really matters. KT's position was just simply better. They were in a better game state, and they were able to take it because of it. They're up 1-0 now, and they're in the commanding spot in this series. If they can go up 2 to nothing against JD Gaming, that's going to be, you know, incredible. That's going to set the League of Legends world ablaze, if you will, but JDG's definitely a team that isn't going to go down without a fight. This is definitely possibly uh, just a wake-up call for them, and I can imagine a better draft coming out and them tying it up at one apiece, but we're going to have to see which one it's going to end up being, because the winner of game number two was... 
JD Gaming. They are going to take game number two. They're going to tie up this series at one apiece, and this is a lot closer to the JDG I expected to see in this series. Game number one, while it really wasn't all that bad from them, they kind of just got outplayed by a really well-performing KT Rolster team. Not so much the case here in game two, although I do think the draft did have a bit to play in that. I'm not going to say the draft is the only thing because JDG has overcome bad drafts basically all year, but I think they gave themselves some more advantageous matchups, put themselves in some better positions to actually be able to play fast early on in the games, and a couple of uh, picks that just have not been working out at Worlds going over to the side of KT Rolster. We've seen some... I don't want to say mistakes on red side, but some questionable decisions in terms of drafting on red side in this series. Quickly talking about draft. Basically the exact opposite of what I said in game number one. Well, it's the same thing that I said in game number one, just now in favor of JDG instead of KT Rolster. I'm so happy to see Oriana continue to get punished when you're, you know, picking it into these bad matchups. Nico obliterates Oriana. I would argue that this is an even worse matchup than the Akali matchup. I think this is Ori's worst matchup in the current meta, and I understand that Ori is still generally good even if she has a bad matchup across from her. I'm not going to sit here and try and argue that Ori is a bad champion or that instinctively just picking her in this matchup and, you know, just saying like, screw it, it doesn't really matter what Ori is playing into, she's going to do Ori things throughout the rest of the game it is like awful, awful process. But what I am going to say is that you are taking the risk of getting absolutely bodied in the laning phase and having no pressure in the mid game coming from the middle of your map. And especially when you're playing a jungler that generally is a little bit slower in this game, it's a problem. Like they weren't, KT Rolster was just never able to recover that. The Nico had so much tempo moving around the map. Of course, Knight did make a few errors in the early game, but he eventually overcame those to have a really good game overall and made a really big impact, and I do think a bit of that was the champion selection. I've talked about this quite a bit, but... If you want to take a mid laner on B1 or blind in general, because it is quite a difficult meta to take a blind mid laner in, in my opinion, but if you're going to do that, Nico is, should be the pick. In my, I, I still think Nico should be the highest priority mid laner in the game at the moment. She has performed the best at Worlds in terms of what she's been able to do into a variety of matchups, and while she may not be as consistent in the late game as what Oriana offers, I think her early game is just so good that it's really hard for me to consider her anything other than an elite level mid laner, and we've seen that play out over the course of this tournament. And that played out here. We see the Jinx as an answer to the Aphelios. I This is Jinx favor. This is one of the few matchups where I think Aphelios is going to struggle. Kind of similarly to what I talk about with like Kaisa and Zaya, where Kaisa is really strong, but she struggles into Zaya. Aphelios is really good, but he does struggle quite a bit into Jinx. It's always been a pretty difficult matchup for him. So Ruler pulling that out does a really good number in this game. And he was the big team fight carry for this team. Although we'll talk about the setup and why I didn't end up giving player of the game to him. The Rakan is obviously still huge, missing so good at this champion. And Rakan has been underplayed at this tournament. He's still the best support in the game. In my opinion, we see the Aatrox, you know, very consistent into the Renekton, and then Vi, I think is interesting. I think Vi loses a bit of her, I guess, niche, if you want, because she is really, in, in the meta right now, she's a Jarvan counter. Like, that's what I would play Vi for, is I would pick her in preparation of going against Jarvan. When Jarvan's banned out, I don't think Vi is nearly as valuable, but if you do want to play her, like, she can still be pretty consistent setup. I just think JDG's draft is better. I do think you have win conditions. I don't think the Aphelios is completely outclassed here, and I think the Viego has the potential to get online. But R5 Renekton is shown to just be kind of a bad pick, even if I really don't hate the matchup for Renekton. And, you know, Oriana's just not in a position in this game where she can actually do a whole ton. Renata's going to have a lot more trouble in these, uh, I guess, asymmetrical non-front-to-back teamfights. That's just always going to be a bit of a problem for Renata. If you're not grouping up, then she's going to have a little bit more of a difficult time transitioning into the late game, and that's kind of what we saw. But I think JDG still had to play it better, and they absolutely did player of the game is going to go to Knight for me in the mid lane. I know a lot of people are going to want to see this player of the game go to Ruler. Some are going to want to see it go to Missing in the support position, but I don't think they win this game without Knight's ultimates in the back half. Maybe call me biased, call me whatever, right? Because I know I'm a big Knight fan and I, I get a lot of these comments on my LPL videos because I give him player of the game a lot there too. And a lot of it's like, you're only giving it to Knight because you like him and you're trying to further a narrative. If you want to believe that, that's fine. I think I've proven many times over the course of this channel's history that I'm not afraid to say when I'm wrong, and I'm not afraid to be like, yeah, this player had a really bad game. I gave Knight Dud of the game in game number one. Like, I'm, I'm not afraid to, you know, give others credit for good plays, but I do think Knight was the most important player for JDG in this game. Those ultimates from Nico were legitimately game-changing. Him hitting them worse, you know, like, that, that's what ended up 
uh, winning those team fights in the back half of the game. I love Ruler, and I love the fact that he was able to clean up a lot of those fights on the Jinx. He was able to do a ton of damage, and he really was a lot more valuable than aiming in this game, but he doesn't get that opportunity without Knight, in my opinion. Missing's engages and setups were a lot more consistent than in game number one, but he was also helped out a ton by the positioning of the Nico in this game. Just generally, a lot of the pressure and tempo that was created from having such an advantageous mid lane matchup that he was able to generate in the mid game and then obviously transition that into the late game was kind of the difference maker for JDG, and you've got to be proud of them for being able to capitalize on that. Kanavi was really good on Vi. Uh, I still don't love the champion, but Kanavi's just uh, so good that it doesn't really matter at times. And obviously, 369 was better. He was going into Renekton, who can't buy a win here at Worlds right now. So, you know, good game from JDG, but I want to give a lot of credit to the setup, as much as I think it's going to go in most part to the carry. And then for KT Rolster, it's just a frustrating loss. You kind of fell into some of your own traps in this game, which I really think is sus. Like, it's not good. Like, you don't really want to do that. R2, Orianna, into Nico. Like, this wasn't blind. This wasn't a blind Orianna. This is saying, like, oh, I'm going to pick it into Nico. Nico obliterates Ori. This is a horrible matchup for her, and she got trounced in it for a reason. The Aphelios on R1, I think, is fine, but Renekton on R5, it's just, it's not working. Like, I get that, you know, he's a strong champion, and he should be performing better. I still like Renekton in theory, but clearly the execution of Renekton is just simply not there right now. At some time, you just have to say, okay, whatever experience in scrims or in solo queue that I've been getting that leads me to believe that Renekton is doing well just simply has to be at least toned down a bit in circumstances like this because... It's just not playing out that way, especially into something like Aatrox. Aatrox has kind of wrecked Renekton this entire tournament. Aatrox is, you know, maybe I just don't know my top lane matchups well enough, but, you know, Aatrox has overperformed my expectations at this tournament. I would consider him not great into Renekton or Cassante, but he has beaten both. Super consistently talked about that in yesterday's video, and Renekton, I would say, is in a good position against Aatrox, but he can't buy a win at this championship, and so I have to believe my eyes right now, and what my eyes tell me is that Renekton is certainly not worthy of an R5 into Aatrox, and that Aatrox is maybe the best top laner in the game, barring Cassante at the moment, even maybe including Cassante at the moment. Rumble's obviously in that discussion as well, but a very different type of champion, and so Keen's gonna get dead of the game, because this Renekton was awful, like, no damage, no lane pressure, which is all Renekton really has to offer in this current meta, and in the late game, he was just kind of a body that ended up getting Jinx more stacks for Get Excited, and that's just worst case scenario. There's, there's just nothing that this Renekton could do the entire game. Keen has been a non-factor at this tournament, and it's really frustrating that he continues to perform as such. I think Renekton had an opportunity here. I'm not going to blame it entirely on the champion, because I do think that the player obviously still needs to perform, and Keen has not been, you know, doing what he needs to do to provide this team with pressure on the top side, but I definitely think the champion had a bit to play in it. The Diego continues to fall down, I think, priority ladders. We've seen this champion perform well at this tournament, but not recently. And then, like I said, I think Cuz generally was fine. BDD got outclassed. Uh, Orianna's just in a bad spot here. Aiming was fine, I guess. He made a couple of errors on the Aphelios, but he really didn't do anything this game. And uh, Renata had a really hard time actually being able to, to pilot this champion and, and be useful in the late game. I like Lehens, but he was really never positioned in the right spot, and it really cost them in the long run. So... Kind of a rough game, I would say, overall, uh, for KT Rolster. It is 1-1, though. Obviously, the series is only tied up. You won game one, so you still have that leeway, but we're going into a game three now with everything tied up. One team is going to be on series point by the end of this one. Who's it going to be? Well, the winner of game number three was... JD Gaming. They are going to take game number three. They're going to regain control of this series by taking a 2-1 series lead. And we had nothing to worry about. I know they lost game one. I know things were looking a little bit more dicey than maybe you would want to see from them, you know, at the start of this. But they're back, baby. This was an awesome game from JDG. Basically, everybody on the team performing at a ridiculously high level. A couple of players looking completely world class. It's a standard JDG experience. It's, you know, trusting the process. They lost game one in the LPL a couple of times. We can, we can pretend it just never happened. It is still 2-1 and KT's not dead in the water just yet. The series isn't over because it's best of five. But... But JDG definitely firmly regaining control and showing why I think a lot of people considered them tournament favorites here in game number three. For KT Rolster, you know, you had your moment where you were looking pretty good. You had a really good draft in game number one. But ever since then, honestly, I feel like you've kind of biffed it. I feel like you've put yourself in a position that's honestly not ideal. Taking combos and team comps that you feel super comfortable on that might not necessarily be all that good into the opponents that you're facing. I really hated some specific draft picks in this draft for KT, and, you know, we'll talk about that now, I guess, since we start with draft. 
but I think the solo lanes are doomed. I really think that <laughs> there's not a lot of really good process coming in from KT in terms of picking the solo laners. Now, you don't always have to pick for lane. Like, I, I completely agree that picking for lane is not a necessity, but Rel plus Azir isn't exactly the most dynamic jungle mid duo in the entire game. Azir in general is there if you want to try to scale, but looking at JDG's roster, you're just never going to be able to outscale them. Orianna plus Sivir, it's just never, even with the Wukong, right, or Aatrox, you're just never going to be able to team fight 5v5 in the way that you might want to with the Azir in this comp. So Azir needs to offer you something else. If that's not really going to be what this team wants to play for, then Azir needs to do something else. And the problem is he doesn't. He's the worst matchup in the meta into Orianna. I've said that multiple times throughout this tournament, just in general. And again, Orianna gets off scot-free getting blind picked. And it's just, I'm not going to say it's frustrating, but like every time Orianna gets counterpicked, she gets dumpstered and she loses. And every time Orianna doesn't get counterpicked, she just wins the game for free because she's really strong right now if she's allowed to do everything she wants to do. It's crazy how teams just keep allowing this to happen. I really don't think that she's that broken of a champion. You just need to be able to play the things that beat her. And we know BDD does. It's just kind of a crazy turn of events. Nico getting banned, I think, is a good idea from JD Gaming, though, if they do want to early pick the Orianna. But also top lane, I don't really get this at all. Picking Jax into Aatrox, like... I'm low on Aatrox, or at least I was going into this tournament, but if you would have asked me what Aatrox's best matchup in the meta was, it's Jax. I just, I don't particularly understand why you would want to opt into this matchup if you're keen. It's another decision that I just think is very poor. I think in top lane, mostly you are looking for matchups. Like in mid lane, it's like, yeah, you know, you need to fit to what the team needs if you need somebody that can be a little bit more consistent at the time of the game that you're playing for. I understand that, but... Top lane, you really need something that isn't going to get absolutely dumpstered by Aatrox because 369 is really good at that champion. And then you opt into Jax. It's just very strange and very weird, in my opinion. I don't like this KT draft, and I think it's hurting them. Now, I, I, sitting here and talking about draft, like, I, I'm always the one who's like, draft is at most like 25% of the calculation when it comes to who I think is going to win a game. Yes, it's very important, but we've seen plenty of really good teams win bad drafts super consistently. You still need to outplay your opponents and outplay them, JD. G did. This was basically a flawless game, especially from their stars. You want to talk about Knight and Ruler and Missing and Kanavi, even 369, right? Like, they were perfect this game. They didn't really do anything wrong. Player of the game was honestly kind of difficult, if only because everybody on JDG was really strong in this one, but pretty obviously, it's going to go to Missing in the support position. What a Rakan game. I think at this point, you simply have to ban it against him. It wasn't a game breaker in game one, but it has been in games two and three, and you just don't want to deal with it anymore. He's been super good on this champion all year, his entire career, really, even going back to the WE days for missing, he's been really good on Rakan. And I just wouldn't expect, you know, KT to continue to let this through. Maybe if they're blue side, they could theoretically want to first pick it, which is why they probably left it up in this draft. But Zaya became available, so they just took Zaya. And that is the right call. Like, Zaya is incredibly strong, the strongest champion in the game right now, in my opinion. But Rakan is really strong as well, and Missing is very good at that champion. You need to find ways to get him off of that, because he is simply too comfortable right now. And this truly was, like, a, a top one world-class performance. Going into Lehens, who I consider to be arguably the top one support support in the world right now in terms of what he's performed like over the course of the entire year. Uh, I think Kanabi's the other player that I definitely consider here. I know his scoreline doesn't look nearly as clean as a lot of his teammates in this game, but his engages on Wukong made that champion look broken. I've been a little bit low on Wukong, but he's actually looked really good at this tournament. Similar to my opinions on Aatrox, I feel like I maybe just underestimated the champion going into it, but you know, he's been really solid. I think R5, especially if you're in a position where you can create early impact, or if you just want to solidify potential skirmishes or just even have a good initiator in team fights, he just does a lot. We've seen a couple of players go towards Wukong. Obviously, we saw Levy go towards towards him a ton. But Kanavi's really one of the only other players at the tournament that is playing this champion. And it is working out. But how much of that is Kanavi being really good and how much of that is Wukong being really good? It's really hard to know. But it definitely is working for him. Knight was really good, Ruler was solid, those two are just so mechanically good that if you give them great setup like the Rakan and the Wukong gave them this game, of course they're going to be able to make something of it. Knight had a much easier laning phase on the Orianna in this one, going into Azir who had his early game nerfed. It's just a lot more of a simple laning phase, and Orianna outscales everybody in the mid lane right now. And Sivir obviously is actually relatively okay into Zaya, if only because uh, Zaya, the thing that really makes her broken is the fact that she's probably the best AD carry for the early game right now in the meta, and also she's one of the best hyper 
carries in the game. There really isn't a part of the game that you're not just winning with her on, but Sivir actually is one of the few champions that could theoretically outpace her in the back half of the game, specifically if that Sivir does have resources, which of course she did have this game because JDG just won early. 369 was solid on the top side in a very good matchup. JDG took advantage of the matchups they got and really just kind of outplayed KT to the point where this didn't feel like a particularly close game. And for KT, I'm worried, man. It feels like they're a little bit demoralized right now. A couple of individual errors. Dud of the game was a little bit difficult. It was between Keen and Lehens for me. I think you could theoretically give it to either of them, which is frustrating because they are, you know, the two players that really kind of got this team to Worlds in the first place. In my opinion, the two most valuable players to KT in the LCK, and they're really the two that have not performed in this series in particular. But I'm going to give it once again to Keen, if only because the tipping point is the fact that he he's the one who opted in to playing Jax into Aatrox and then getting absolutely slapped around in that laning phase. I just don't know what was going through his head. It's a very weird decision, but Keen has just been a massive disappointment at this tournament. I don't like to sit here and say that like, oh, you know, we shouldn't judge players just based on one tournament, but you know, I'm not going to fully affect Keen in, you know, in terms of what his rankings might be in 2024 because of this tournament, but it is worth noting that he has been, like, legit one of the worst top lingers at this tournament, especially in the quarterfinals and in, even in the Swiss stage. Like, he's just has not been good. It's, he's lost almost every matchup that he has played. Whatever magic he had in the LCK, it is not translated at all to the international stage. But Lahans also was basically a non-factor this game on the Nautilus. Really no good engage avenues and really not a lot of great targets. Yes, there are some immobile, quote-unquote, carries. It's mostly just Rihanna on the other side if you want to consider her immobile with her speed up, but outside of that, you don't have great targets. Sivir can spell shield you, which is probably what's going to happen unless she's in rel range for some reason, or she can spell shield the Zaya feather pullback, whatever she ends up wanting to do, but Sivir has options for how she wants to navigate that, and obviously you can't really engage on anybody else because Rakan's just going to immune it, and Wukong clone is just too big of a threat, and so... You know, Lenz just doesn't have a very easy time playing Nautilus here, but he also underperformed, I think. I think aiming scoreline is also way better than he performed. I was hyping him up a ton from his Swiss stage performance. I think his Swiss stage was very good, uh, but you can see a little bit of the outclassing that happens when he goes up against the best AD carry in the world in Ruler. It's a little bit different playing the, you know, the players that he played in the, in the main stage and then playing Ruler. Like, I love Deft. But aiming outclassing Deft is not the same as aiming outclassing Ruler, at least in 2023. And then, you know, BDD was actually pretty good this game on the Azir. He was trying to keep it alive. You know, some of the damage he was able to do on Azir was pretty solid. The problem is that Azir's just not very good into the team comp that JDG ended up drafting. You don't really have a lot of avenues to ever really be that strong because you want to scale into the late game. But looking at JDG's comp, you're like the third strongest champion in the game in the late game anyways because both Ori and Sivir outpace you. And so it's just... It's not a great Azir game. It's, there's not a lot he could do. So in general, KT's definitely got, you know, some, some work to do. They are one game away from being eliminated from Worlds after a pretty horrendous draw against JDG, but they put up a fight before. They've already beaten JDG once. Who's to say they can't at least do it twice and push us to a Silver Scrapes game number five? But JDG doesn't want that to happen. They're going to try to close this out as quickly as possible. Can they do that? Well, the winner of game number four was... JD Gaming, they are going to take game number four. They're going to close out this series with a 3-1 win. And they'll win three in a row to really cement themselves as the team we all kind of expected to see going into this series. They did give away game number one to KT with a little bit of a, a weird draft and some, you know, KT, pl KT playing great. Honestly, I don't want to take that away from them. It wasn't JDG messing up. It wasn't them making any major errors. It was KT being put in a good position and taking full advantage of it. But JDG was just a little bit unstoppable for the rest of this series. And I think this game is the best encapsulation of that. Because honestly, you look at the draft for this game and I think it's majorly KT Rollster. Favorite. I think they did a really good job to put themselves in a good position in game number four and actually give themselves a lot of opportunities. And quite frankly, a lot of them did play incredibly well. A lot of those matchups did end up going pretty in their favor. The problem is that JDG just has the best players in the world. So when you get down to it, when you get down to the nitty gritty, these back and forth moments where both teams have an opportunity to win in the back half of the game. Am I taking aiming and BDD and Keen, or am I taking Kanavi and Knight and Ruler and missing? I think we know the answer to that, and we got that proven in this game number four here. A blast. This is probably the most fun game of the quarterfinals up until this point. It ended with a freaking cannon minion taking the Nexus. Give that guy a skin if JDG wins Worlds. Anyways, really, really fun. But like I said earlier, I actually think KT Rolster won draft. I think they're in a really good spot here. I think bot lane is in a great spot. I think mid lane is in a great spot. I think top lane is in a great spot. Obviously, you get B1 Zaya, which is obviously really strong. It's always going to be something that you can feel very comfortable on because Zaya just doesn't really have a lot of answers. But 
There are some early game champions that can kind of negate the safety that Zaya likes to feel, or really late game champions that can scale alongside her. You know who doesn't do that? Kaisa. Zaya, like, I, I don't understand this. Credit to Ruler. We'll talk about Ruler. But he opted into really the only bad Kaisa matchup in the game right now. It's what I've been talking about over the course of this tournament is that, you know, Kaisa's results have kind of shied people away from wanting to early pick her. In this tournament, we've seen an adaptation more towards Aphelios or even things like Sivir and Zeri, as we've seen throughout this series, as opposed to Kaisa. But really, when you look at the, the nitty gritty of why those stats exist, most of Kaisa's losses at this tournament are to Zaya. That's really been the problem is that Zaya was not super banned at the beginning of this tournament. People didn't realize that she needed to be taken off the board basically every single time on red side or else you were going to be in some trouble. And so Zaya was getting through a lot and it was being answered with the Kaisa and Kaisa was not winning that matchup. And that's why Kaisa's win rate started to plummet. We look at the end of the Swiss stage when Zaya was starting to get banned and Kaisa was getting some selected plays. She was absolutely killing it. Typically speaking, I'm going to say play Kaisa. Kaisa is the number 280 carry in the meta right now, and she only loses to the number 180 carry. And so if you take that off the board, you're in a good spot. But you picked it into Zaya in this game. You waited for Zaya to be picked before you brought out the Kaisa, which is pretty insane. This is, you know, a weird draft strategy. And even saying that, like, I really like Lulu into Rakan. That's always generally been a very Lulu favored matchup because the polymorph is just so strong into him. You don't really have a lot of good counters to that in the mid game. Syndra is one of the best counters in the game to Orianna. That's one of the classic mid lane matchups that I'm sure, you know, all people who have played mid lane for seven years are tired of hearing about is how good Syndra is to Orianna. I've been high on Syndra throughout this process. Jax has a relatively good matchup into Gragas, even if I think Gragas does some relatively interesting things in team fights here. And obviously, it's 369 on the champion that he is probably most well known for. So you're looking at this draft and you're seeing a bunch of winning lanes for KT Rolster. You're seeing a lot of opportunity for them to win early, but you're also seeing scaling because Zaya scales, Jax scales, Syndra scales, and you have free engage with Vi. You have a Lulu to help out. Like, you have a lot of options in this game to be able to win it. The problem. Like I said, is that JD Gaming is simply just better. They were able to outplay a lot of these circumstances where even if their champions aren't in optimal situations and aren't able to contribute as well as maybe you would expect them to, in other circumstances, they're still going to be able to beat you in most cases, which we'll talk about. Player of the game for me is going to go to Ruler in the bot lane, 8-0-3 on Kai'Sa. I can sit here and talk all this shit about how I don't like Kai'Sa into Zaya. I think it's Kai'Sa's only bad matchup in the meta right now, and it's the reason she has been pushed out. But man... If you get to that late game, if you're able to get to the part where Kaisa can really just start to dominate, then it doesn't matter. Kaisa is still Kaisa, and I get that people are out on this champion, and they've been out, and Reddit was obviously super out. They were making all of these, you know, uh, posts that, oh, Kaisa's overrated. Clearly, she's not as good because she had, like, a 44% win rate or something like that, which is still fine in pro. But no, actually, if you put Kaisa on a good AD carry, she's gonna be super free low, like... It's always been like this. We've actually seen this in the back half of the Swiss stage. Even at the beginning of the quarterfinals here, there's been a couple of players that have pulled out Kaisa, and it's been like, God, this champion is just so strong. Credit to Ruler, obviously, because you still need a lot of skill to pull her off, specifically in this matchup. But if you have that skill, if you truly do believe you're the better AD carry, Kaisa can absolutely decimate games. And she did that here. Ruler was fantastic. He was really good across this whole series. Not quite player of the series as a whole for me, but still really good. Now, player of the series is going to go to missing for me. The support, uh, four games of Rakan. What can I say? He dominated on Rakan. This is a bad matchup. I know people don't remember how bad Rakan into Lulu is, but it's pretty tough to play out. We saw that in game number one of this series where Lulu did a really good job of being able to negate a lot of missings and gauges. It really was the only game that he didn't completely take over in, but he's so good that it ends up not mattering. Missing is just on a different level in terms of what he's been able to do. He's quickly climbing the support rankings, being closer and closer to number one if he's not already there in the entire world. Awesome performance from him. Knight was sensational in this game. He lost a little bit early, but that's what you're supposed to do in this matchup. Syndra is specifically there to scale alongside Ori while also applying pressure in the in the mid game where you can actually skirmish around her a bit better. It's a really good matchup for Syndra, but when Knight ends up team fighting, he's one of the best team fighters in the entire world. And Ori is still Oriana. If you get to 25, 30 minutes into the game, Oriana Shockwave and Combo is going to be a bit of a problem. Basically,
basically no matter who you are playing into it. And Knight was a problem in this game. The bottom three, the main three, Knight and Ruler obviously as the carries and then missing as the facilitator. They took over this game and, you know, it was really close for a long time, but they are the ones who pushed it forward. Now, Dud of the game is actually going to stay on JD Gaming because it's going to go to 369 on this one. He rolled all threes in this game number four. Luckily, he was able to get away with it because the rest of the team did so well in the rest of this game, but this was not a particularly good performance coming in from the Gragas. You would have hoped to see a little bit more from an R5 champion, but he picked himself into a counter matchup, which has happened so many times at this tournament. I wonder if I'm just wrong, like, but every single time like they lose, they get these like counter pick matchups and they just lose them. And I'm like, okay, we all saw this coming. Why did you do this in the first place? But I digress. This is probably his worst game, not only of the tournament, but in quite a long time. He just simply hasn't lost like this in a considerable amount. It has been consistently uh, sixes and nines. Nice over the last, like, I don't know, year. And uh, so to see him have like such a bad game, it definitely was a little bit jarring, but it ended up not mattering, like I said, Knight, Ruler, Missing were so good that it ended up not costing them too much, and, you know, now JD Gaming's moving on to the semifinals. They felt pretty confident, I think, in this draw and in this matchup, but to get it done, I think, is definitely a good thing, especially after going down 1-0, and then for KT, that's going to be the end of the line, it's going to be the end of their 2023 season, and it has to be considered a resounding success. I know it might not feel like that. But first of all, losing to JD Gaming in the bracket stage at Worlds is certainly nothing to scoff at, especially being able to take a game off of them is really, really positive when, you know, your region just doesn't seem to be doing all that well internationally at the current moment. But even, you know, individually looking at what KT has been able to do over the course of this year, they were the number one seed in the summer split, only losing to T1. Yes, it was twice in the playoffs. But I mean, genuinely being one of the best Korean League of Legends teams after, I know me and a lot of other people didn't expect to see them at Worlds this year. There were a couple of super teams in the LC. CK. You know, Hanwha Life was supposed to be better than them. Even a team like DRX really underperformed, but KT Rolster was the one to make it count and to really step up. A lot of these players had really rough 2022s, so to see them bounce back this year with such fantastic performances is great. Keen, BDD, you know, these players struggled a lot last year. Aiming was a big breakout in 2022, but it was a question whether or not it was replicable. Lehens was coming off of one of the best teams in the world with one of the best bot leaners in the world who we had to play against in this series. Could he separate on his own? And all of these players proved that they genuinely are world-class, elite-level players. They just weren't quite enough to be able to get over the best team in the world. But KT is genuinely a very, very strong team, and they deserve to be here now. Talking about this game for at least a little bit, Keen was awesome. This is Keen's best game of the tournament, and it's not even close. He waited to have one game where he finally broke out until the elimination game for KT Rolster, which I'm sure is at least a little bit frustrating for them, but it really was a great performance, and honestly, he was the one keeping this game alive. BDD had a couple of really clutch stuns on the Syndra. Cuz was really good in some of these fights. The Lulu was very important. Aiming was dealing damage. KT tried in this game. They just got outplayed. Knight and Ruler were the two best players on the Rift, and unfortunately for them, that just meant they weren't going to be able to win this game, but I don't think it should take away from what they were able to accomplish this year in general. So many positives, and just because they're not moving on to the semifinals doesn't mean we shouldn't look back. Look back on 2023 is a great year for KT, and then for JD Gaming, semifinals it is. They don't know their opponent yet. It's going to be the winner of LNG and T1 tomorrow. Very excited for that. Both of those matchups are super entertaining and definitely ones I'm very much looking forward to, but I mean, at this pace, can anybody really stop JD Gaming? All right, but that is going to do it for my Worlds 2023 Day 3 of the Quarterfinals Overview and Analysis video. JD Gaming moving on to the semifinals, and they will be playing the winner of tomorrow's series between LNG Esports and T1. I'm very excited for that. If you want to know my full thoughts on what I expect to happen in that series and, you know, why I would favor one team or the other or, you know, who I think is going to be moving on, you can go ahead and check out my primer video that I posted before the quarterfinals started, my quarterfinals preview, my full bracket prediction, all of that. You can go ahead and check out that video, but quickly talking about it, just storyline-wise, it's super fun. Not only is it Scout versus Faker, two former, you know, SKT mid lane prodigies going up against each other, but, you know, it's LNG with the potential to put all four LPL teams from this tournament into the semifinals. The four LPL teams that qualified for Worlds would be the four top teams at the tournament, which would certainly solidify them as by far the best region in the world. But T1 in Korea, in their home country, looking to basically avoid disaster and just get one Korean team into the semifinals and potentially be a team that could make a run. It's a very, very fun storyline, and I'm interested to hear and kind of know what you guys think of it down in the comments section below, who do you think is going to be able to take it? What players are you watching? What matchups 
are you looking out for? Would love to know it down in the comment section below. But of course, if you did enjoy the video, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you are new here, hit the subscribe button. We're covering the rest of this tournament every single day that there are games on this channel. And if you liked this video, I promise you're going to like a lot of the others. Of course, when this tournament is over... We're going to be doing a lot of off-season content as well. A lot of these teams, especially in the West, are already building. They are already starting to lock stuff in, starting to finalize. So if you're excited to hear about 2024, all the roster rumors and free agency movings and changes, hit subscribe. We're going to be covering them on this channel after this uh, Worlds Tournament as well. But with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all